Good evening. Um, welcome and uh, thank you very much for um, coming to listen to me speak tonight. Um, I have to say, I apologize uh, that you're not actually listening to me speaking tonight. You were listening to me speaking actually last week because this is recorded. Um, I am I'm deeply apologetic that I wasn't able to be there, but I am currently working on a film shoot um, for a TV series called Becoming Elizabeth. And in the way of these things, uh, they decided to change the schedule. Um, with, of course, no consultation with me because, you know, who am I in the big cog of things? And um, they, uh, I have now been called to um, uh, Gloucestershire. I was in Oxford, um, Oxfordshire, and now I've gone to Gloucestershire to Barclay Castle, where I am currently uh, filming uh, a story of the young Elizabeth I. Um, I believe it's, I think it's Amazon and um, it will be coming out and uh, it is a rather, uh, let's say, a sexed up version of her early life, but um, uh, myself and Tamsin Lewis, who some of you may know, um, are involved in that. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to deliver the lecture live. Um, so thank you very much, Historical Dance Society, for first asking me but then also allowing me to be able to still convey um, my uh, experience, my, my, my little opinions on medieval dance uh, this evening. I am going to endeavor to join you for the questions. Um, I'm not sure what my wrap time is going to be tonight, um, but ideally because I um, this is my passion this period and um, I am, I am so disappointed if I will not be able to make at least the question so I can take some of those questions. However, on top of that, uh, if just in case the worst case, I won't be there, please feel free uh, if anyone would like to contact me with questions personally afterwards. Um, I am very, very welcome um, to uh, any contact, any questions, um, any ideas, any um, link ups uh, with other people on this subject in the future. Um, so to begin with that long caveat, uh, thank you very much to the Historical Dance Society, particularly to Lynn and to Anne, who have facilitated as well. Um, uh, so thank you for asking me uh, tonight to speak to you on medieval dance. Um, so um, I'll be taking you through, some of you may have heard me speak before on this subject. Um, this is an ongoing uh, process of um, research, um, uh, of choreography, of experiential choreography that I am developing. Um, and uh, as I talk through um, uh, the, the PowerPoint, the presentation that I have this evening, and uh, some of the things that I've discovered and some of the questions that I still have yet to answer. Um, I'm always interested to uh, discuss and to talk with people out there. Um, uh, so uh, without further ado, I will go into my little screen. Um, so you should be seeing that now, there we go. There is my medieval dance rediscovery, reimagine, and recreation. Um, now I've used those uh, three words. Um, uh, there are many other words, of course, um, reconstruction being one. They are all, as has been um, written about in <coughs> many um, academic pieces on. Um, theories of and ideas of what it means and what it is to take something from the past and then to put it into the present. Um, do we rediscover it? Do we reimagine it? Do we recreate it? Do we reconstruct it? Um, what, are, what are the different terms? Uh, I don't necessarily hold myself to one or, uh, or another. Um, uh, I, as I think I will expressed throughout this presentation. Um, I do believe that you cannot authentically 
recreate or reconstruct. Um, even from one night to the next in a modern dance performance, um, it is a different performance. Uh, there are academics today who talk about types and tokens and that you have a, a choreography or a dance of one type and then they, there are several tokens that appear each time it is performed but they are all related to that one type. Um, uh, that goes on to that opens up a wider can of worms of ontology and all sorts of things which I will not be going into tonight, uh, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, but I think to even be able to begin to explore um, what is under the umbrella of medieval dance, I think one already has to um, let go of a, um, uh, a desire or a wish to be able to do something that is um, absolutely to the nail authentic, whatever that means. Not that I necessarily say that that is achievable either. Um, I do, however, subscribe to very strongly um, something that is historically informed. Um, and that is what I hopefully will be presenting to you tonight. This is an ongoing labor of love, if you like. Um, and I'm sure that there are many amongst you there who share um, my love. Um, I will be, to uh, qualify as we work through this presentation, uh, I will be starting from a, a position that is accessible to all. So if you have never, ever, ever heard of medieval dance at all in, the, in your life or what on earth it means, then you'll be able to follow uh, what I'm talking about tonight. If you have already, of course, done maybe quite a lot of study into uh, the forms of medieval dance, uh, what we already know about it, then hopefully you should also find things of interest in this PowerPoint and this presentation uh, as well. So I've tried to sort of encompass all in this, uh, springboard off into many different things uh, to spark perhaps um, newbies interest, but also to um, give someone who is uh, more involved and has had more experience um, to give them something to think about as well. Um, so that's where I am going from. So what do we know? Now, to qualify again from those uh, amongst you who may not know that much about um, uh, dance from the past, historical dance or hysterical dance, as they call it in drama schools, um, or period dance or uh, stuff that happened lots and lots and lots and lots of years ago. Um, so, uh, of course, it is fairly widely accepted that the first time dance has been written down or at least the earlier the earliest document we have found that some little letters were written on a page which made a choreography was around the mid 15th century a lovely man called Domenico uh, there were uh, some other manuscripts that um, uh, have emerged and are surviving from the 15th century and many many dance historians work from that point uh, so they think well We'll work from the point that the actual steps have been written down. Now, maybe I like a bit of a challenge. Hmm, I'm not sure, but uh, I've gone a little bit backwards from that. And I've thought, you don't need steps written down. No, why would we need that? You know, uh, when we know we at least have music and pictures and accounts and all sorts of things. Um, so this is specifically about movement, dance, dance or dramatic moving, what we may call physical theatre today, um, presentations that were physical, which have occurred from around the 11th, 12th, late 11th, 12th, 13th and 14th centuries. Okay, now as it stands, there is no written choreography found, surviving, discovered. Um, there may be a reason for that, which I'll come on to later, but um, it is also, uh, there may still just be some that just hasn't been found. It could be sitting in someone's attic somewhere, who knows? Um, uh, everyone search their attics and then we might find something. 
<laughs> Maybe that's the name that we should all do. Um, however, we do have music, um, which is identified as dance music. We have accounts, um, both allegorical and factual sort of uh, written uh, accounts or court and church accounts uh, on dance as a subject. Um, we have iconography. Um, we have um, uh, uh, we have music. I think I mentioned music, haven't I? So it is there. We know that people did dance. Of course they did. Um, we go back as far as ancient Greece. Of course we have our iconography there. We have um, accounts. Uh, in fact, the whole of ancient Greek um, theatre is based upon movement. Um, so of course people did it. Uh, it's silly to assume and uh, that people didn't. Uh, what I am opening the discussion uh, about tonight is what might it have looked like? Well, I don't know. What has been identified, certainly in the written um, accounts that we find, sometimes crossing over with some of the iconography and again, sometimes and or crossing over with the musical um, notation, which in itself is fragmentary. Um, that we do have. So I have a list here, of course, the dance macabre or the dancing mania, St Vitus dance, uh, for example. So there are um, there are many accounts, usually um, in church records or in court records um, of this sort of dancing mania uh, that has occurred um, throughout largely the 12th and 13th century. Um, uh, we don't know whether this was a, a kind of trance dance. Um, there are some theories out there uh, as um, uh, researchers have written about them. It, uh, whether it was an illness, um, uh, if you think uh, the mania, if we take the mania first, uh, the, the idea of someone shaking uncontrollably, uh, if we think of Parkinson's that we recognize today, um, uh, or indeed a form of epilepsy. So there is, uh, it, it may, it could have been a whole, and I do believe, you know, there is no reason to necessarily pigeonhole it into one or the other. It could well be um, a whole host of reasons that was then pushed into, we are living in a time which is God-fearing, we live in a time which is controlled by the church, um, and people understand things through the spiritual, through the um, existential, through the um, esoteric, through the, the spiritual world. So um, there is dancing uh, mania and there's also the dance macabre. Of course, we have those um, very famous images of the dancing skeletons, the dancing of the dead. Um, the church records that we have often uh, through the 12th, 13th and 14th century, band dance, of course, um, or don't see dance as um, something that is necessarily godly. Um, this does lead on through the centuries as well. Dance is, is often seen as lascivious or as something that is uh, you dance with the devil as opposed to dancing with God. Um, uh, now, we don't have any accounts, or written accounts of what a dance macabre would have looked like if it even was a dance um, or whether it was just a, a, an image of dancing skeletons. We don't know. Um, uh, there, there was a famous, of course, modern piece, The Dance Macabre, written, um, but uh, it, is, it is lost to their annals of time. Um, now, the other uh, dances that are the other names that I have listed here are subscribed to um, specific dance tunes or dance accounts that we have. Now, uh, the first one I've listed, Carol. Um, this is again, this is for opening up, widening up access and for anyone who hasn't encountered medieval dance before. I will say, however, those of you that have and have used the word farandole, never, uh, the first accounted use of the word farandole as a dance was in 1785. It's not a medieval word. It's a bit of a thing that I have, that I will say it's not a farandole, it's a carol. <laughs> um, so uh, circular carol, a linear carol um, are, are forms. And of course, often the accounts um, lead to it being a sung dance. Um, so a dancer, sometimes done with women, are sometimes mixed, um, often with an accompaniment, some sort of, you know, someone maybe the leader holding a drum or the one at the end holding a drum or tambourine. Um, so uh, it's a, a carol, not a farandel. Um, um, so, and 
but it is bled into the modern dance patterns of uh, sort of swirling patterns, swirling dances. Um, you know, circular, a line of people, a chain of people holding hands, very, very often depicted in iconography. Um, and uh, if you think even a modern day uh, interpretation of a conga, uh, uh, do, 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 come on, let's do the Congo. So um, it is, you know, it's a very simple, very accessible, all ages, all abilities, everyone can join in the festivities, the ritualistic nature, nature of it. Um, now the Saltarello is a tune from, the, from this period, from the 13th century, um, but it also of course becomes then a dance step and tempo in the mid 15th century. So if one was to draw links between this period and the 15th century, I think this is a very interesting um, avenue to explore. Um, it is a tune. We don't know if there are specific steps until, of course, Domenico does write specific steps in Saltarelli, the Saltarelli. Um, so uh, what uh, a Saltarelli looked like, but we certainly know that it was a upbeat, dynamic, up-tempo, fast dance. Uh, now, this is, uh, again, a dance or a tempo that may be related, but again, the evidence is um, not necessarily clear. We have the Bassa Danza and the Ductia Bassa Danza being the queen of the measures, the slowest, the most noble of forms from the mid 15th century. Now, is, is this then related to a dance tune that we know as Ductia? It may be completely separate, or they may be related. Um, but there are certainly um, tunes that start to merge a little bit of the Bassa Danza Ductia. Um, uh, the Ductia, however, can be played at a fairly swift pace. And a Bassa Danza generally, by the mid 15th century at least, is a slower, as I say, queen of the measures. Um, now, here is an interesting one, which comes up in, in one manuscript in particular, the nota and the paired dances. Um, the nota, we don't, um, uh, uh, don't have necessarily, um, uh, McPhee talks, uh, in, identifies this as a, a music form of a medieval music dance uh, piece, um, but it is difficult to really glean what kind of form it may have take, taken. The paired dances often are um, the uh, Rotter and Tristan, uh, the, the Lamented of Tristan, Tristana, for example. They are a slower piece paired with a quicker piece. Um, again, now this in, it, in a way makes sense that we have these, these paired um, different dynamics, these, these opposing dynamic of these paired dances together. They are music sources that we know are dance. They are music for dance and we can, but we can only guess at what those dances are. We, but can we take an educated guess? Yes, I believe that we can. There are, and uh, I have to take a nod to Robert Mullally in this, uh, in his book, The Carol, while I wouldn't say we necessarily always agree on our conclusions, um, his research into the sources of um, uh, uh, the uh, of medieval dance forms in, uh, in writings and journals, in accounts, um, is, uh, is, is, it is great, it's fantastic, um, and it's a very valuable source. So it's put the Carol, I would highly recommend anyone who's interested in this sub subject. As I say, I think it is a subject that is open to interpretation that one might not always agree on, um, but um, certainly it is very, very useful for source, uh, for discovering a, a collated um, version of many of the sources. And when you look at some of the accounts, we see these words, bal, danse, and tresque which uh, repeatedly appear. Again, there is no indication as to what particularly that form could be, but uh, it, they are identified as dance forms. Are they interchangeable? Are they different words for the same thing? Like we have sort of a, a bop and a jig, you know, today that we use similar words to just mean the generic form of dance. That could be true. Will we ever find out? Mm. Unless there's a manuscript in someone's loft, who knows? Uh, now the final one, which I've done probably the most research into and the most um, reinterpretation of is the estampi. Uh, estampi, estampi. Um, uh, again, 
I will come back into a little bit more detail as a, for using a stampy as a, as a case study for this is the one that I've done the most work on. Um, do we have um, any written accounts as to what this may have looked like? No. Nope. Um, although many people out there would like to think they know what an stampy definitely looks like, which again I'll come on to. Um, uh, do we know it was a dance form? Yes, we do. Do we know it is a very set musical form? Yes, we do. Um, can we therefore maybe make uh, not, you know, educated uh, options as to what this may have been? I believe that we can. Can we make firm assertions? No, no, we can't, uh, but we can certainly explore. Um, so they are, that is a sort of an overview of what um, is, uh, of all of the, the dance forms, styles, that uh, uh, or the main dance forms and styles that have been discovered, uh, talked about, found um, from uh, the period prior to written choreography in the mid fifteenth century. Um, uh, so we don't, we are not working with steps, but we do know that dance, these dances existed in whatever form. Um, the sources that we do have, really, there is only one primary source, uh, Grocchio. Uh, from around 1300 De Musique, which is a, uh, of course, it's a musical. Um, he was a musician, he wrote as a musician, um, and he identifies some pieces of music as dance forms. Um, apart from that, um, there is, as I, I've repeatedly said, there's no written choreography. Um, uh, so what we're working from is piecing together jigsaw pieces um, from uh, other sources, uh, as opposed to dance manuals or descriptions from um, or learning manuals from dancing masters. Um, so um, that's where we're working from. What I haven't said, which I should have said at the beginning, perhaps, but I will say it now. Uh, if we don't have that written choreography, should we then leave it alone? No, absolutely not. I firmly believe, and as I've said at the beginning, it is my passion, this, um, the music that exists out there, I believe is phenomenal and emotional, emotive. It should be heard and it should be danced to. These pieces of music were written as dance music and we need to dance to them. Um, do we need to go on an endless quest to find what is potentially undiscoverable um, and then not dance it because we are scared that it's not authentic. Um, no, no, but we should really embrace, embrace what's there. Uh, now, we really don't get much until about 1907 until Pierre Aubrey writes his Estampies of Dance Royale accounts. Now, much of what we know and what we have interpreted and what uh, this word farandel um, uh, comes from uh, is drawn from Aubrey in 1907, um, which is a shame because I believe that many of our perceptions are have come from that point and um, we should be able to um, really go back to what we need to is to go back in time further, wipe away what our modern perception is and really relook at this stuff. Um, there is a course at Mr. Sachs with his 1937 World of History of Dance. There was a bit of resurgence in the late 60s, Dance and Society History of Dance. And then uh, of course, Peggy Dixon, um, uh, Melissine Wood um, did uh, some work as well um, in this realm or did touch on how you could reconstruct. Um, uh, so, and then Mullally, as I've already mentioned with his 2011, The Carol, um, I wouldn't necessarily, as I've said, um, uh, we can disagree on outcomes, but um, certainly that book has um, a wealth of um, uh, a wealth of sources and source material in there. So really, really, really worth looking at. Um, now, when I have looked at these dances, when I have worked, I've choreographed these dances at places like the Tower of London, so in situ where they would have been performed, um, in other castles from the 13th and 14th century around um, England, um, uh, that um, I have always tried to work from a historically uh, informed perspective. Uh, we have the music, 
uh, we know that we've got the, we've got the dots now. As far as I'm not an early musician, I am a choreographer who works specifically within historical movement and dance. Um, uh, all of these sources, of course, need to be treated with um, caution, but we can still learn from them. Um, um, we, you know, no, we shouldn't dismiss them um, as complete fabrication or uh, falsities. They should tell you, we should be able to glean something from them. Um, uh, as uh, the music that does exist, of course, is um, sometimes as I'm not a specialist in early music, but of course it's sometimes just the bass line and the harmonies that have been created on the top have been modern interpretations or are informed interpretations. The, um, uh, in academia, the uh, research into the uh, questions of authenticity and um, uh, with regards to music is a little bit further ahead than we are in dance. Um, although we are slightly overtaken in terms of arguments to do with ontology at the moment. So uh, I'd have to say, um, but there was a lot of work in the sort of the late nineties, um, early two thousands in terms of arguing through Peter Kybe, um, James Young, uh, you know, wrote extensively on um, what does it mean to be authentic? Um, uh, so, and argued it out and said, you can't be authentic. Um, so again, this is where I start. So if I was to reconstruct uh, a piece for the Tower of London, as I have, I've reconstructed a Ductia and a Stampy uh, for David Castle. Um, Kalenda Meyer being one of perhaps the earliest uh, musical sources that we have, um, 1182, 84, oh God, off the top of my head there. Um, uh, what did it look like? Well, first of all, we've got the music. The music, I will say, uh, can be played differently. You can choose a different musical instrument and it will sound and give an entirely different dynamic. Mm -hmm. When I work as a choreographer, if I'm working with a, uh, a piece of music that is played on a harp and the same piece of music is then played on an electric guitar, I'm going to choreograph something different. Um, and in exactly the same way, if something is played on a flute or played on a shawm uh, or played on a harp and then um, played on bagpipes, um, it is going to have a different feel to it. Um, we don't know how these musical pieces were played. So I do not believe that we can therefore make uh, an absolute assertion as to how these dances for a particular piece of music looked, it could have been any number of ways. What options we have, however, I draw back to iconography. So here we have um, some 14th century um, there uh, from, uh, we have the line dances, these carol pieces here. Very Many of you may have already seen uh, many of these um, pictures already. Um, if you don't, there's lots out. Pinterest is a good source as well. Um, we have men and women here holding hands. We have perhaps a collection of women, maybe a collection of mixed, sometimes is interpreted um, uh, in this one here. Um, holding hands going under the arches that you can see there, um, holding a drum uh, there in pieces. Um, uh, you can see sometimes interpreted as singing, so that so you know is a carol, like our modern Christmas carols, a sung dance. We should dance them now. Um, and then it all gets a little bit frisky. So now, do I think that everyone wore, wore strange animal masks and uh, did almost impossible backbends like this um, uh, gentleman lady over here? Um, of course, artistic interpretation is where we need to use caution. Um, however, the very fact that we have in uh, this I, this piece of um, artwork that goes along with the Raymond de la Rose. Now, Raymond de la Rose is of course a allegorical piece. However, so it's not an account of a true life event, but uh, that would have been inspired from true life events. And here, we, of course, we have, and I think that is a lady standing on her hands. We have two ladies here kissing each other. We have a group of four here dancing in a circle. Uh, there's a musician. We have this, is she dancing? Is she talking up to the sky? Who knows? But this gesture here of the arms raised like this, as in this picture here, is quite frequently seen 
when depicting dance um, or throughout these centuries here. This sort of, now it may be, one could interpret, is it sort of a praise be, praise the Lord? Is it a whirling dervish sort of trance uh, um, uh, affair? Um, could be both. Um, uh, but it is often uh, seen. Is it a strange sort of 1980s vogue? Maybe someone went back in the time machine and started voguing. I think that's probably unlikely, but you never know. Um, what I think I'm getting at here and what we see from here, uh, this again is very, um, uh, we're in a line, people going through the arches. Uh, we know of course masks we use in disguisings uh, frequently through the medieval period. Um, what I am trying to illustrate which, by showing you these pictures here is that um, movement in this period wasn't necessarily slow, po-faced, serious, uh, steady, or any of those things. That movement in this period is often depicted as very lively, as um, acrobatic, um, as uh, you know, <laughs> funky. <laughs> to perhaps say. So the movement this period is not as perhaps has been interpreted before. Um, so that is one thing that I can draw inspiration from. Now, is this precisely how they moved? Artistic impression um, and license, um, but it's not entirely false. Right, here we have again, my two, again, we can see this, this action here. This is perhaps my favorite uh, the two dancing monks <laughs> that we have. Um, uh, now, dance music, of course, I've touched on this already, the Chansonnier du Roi, um, or 844, 844 manuscript 844, um, is, um, has in it the Istan piece, the Istan Royals. It also has three other pieces of dance music. Uh, there's a couple of um, 13th century manuscripts of Robert's Bridge, um, from uh, which are in the BL, uh, the BN, I think it's a Bodleian, I think. Um, uh, so, which also have a collection of dance pieces as well from this period. That's where we get our Sorcerellis, where it gets our dance reals, um, and it's where we get the um, the collection of the eight estampes. Um, now, we have literally no indication of what the movement is, but we do have the dots, we've got the music. Um, and um, I have done some work on the Chansonnier um, uh, de Loire. We, now I can tell you specifically from that music there that the estampes number one and four are from a different hand to a estampes five to eight. Uh, we know that. Now, does that mean that they were written separately, that they're not related? Maybe. Um, does that mean that they were written at a different time? <laughs> Yeah, it's being manuscript, not many people could write. Um, so uh, that it was divvied out to other people, that could have been a, a possibility as well. So um, this is where we are drawing some of the um, uh, music from. There is uh, a 14th century manuscript as well, I will add in just as a segue, because I haven't started work on this, but I do want to, where we get the Istan Peters. Uh, it is from an Italian crusading court, because this is a crusading court manuscript um, from France, uh, but out in uh, modern day uh, Western Greece. Um, so the influences, whereas this is fairly Western European, the influences in the Istan Peter uh, Italian manuscript from slightly later uh, have musically been accepted as fairly um, Eastern influenced, Arabic influenced. Now we know at the time that um, fashion, musical instruments, bagpipes themselves, uh, warfare, uh, was part of a big melting pot of uh, influences that came from the West and the East. Um, it, the Crusades that lasted many, many centuries going into uh, the modern day Middle East, into modern day Iran, Iraq, per the Persia, um, all of these, this culture mixed, music mixed. Now I would argue, and I do believe that movement mixed as well. So influences of movement that came from the Persian region, which we might now consider to be whirling dervishes, trance dance, um, even not as far as belly dance, but as not modern, but certainly, but different styles of music movement. If food, warfare, 
music, musical instruments, fashion, um, tailoring, if that all mixed, it would make sense that the movement did as well. Uh, and certainly this manuscript of the Istanbulites, the musical structures are Arabic influenced. I haven't done much work on it yet on what that movement might be, but uh, there we go. Uh, watch this space. Uh, but the one that I have done, the Chansonnier, is more uh, sort of Western European influenced. Um, now, the other main uh, um, source that I've worked from is the Tournée de Chauvency. It is now this is an allegorical. This is a, a piece of reportage of a Jacques Rattel. Yes, he was writing to please his master, the person who commissioned him. Um, but it's an account of a five day tournament that happened um, in the south of France uh, in 1285. And in it, he has clear uh, descriptions of two of the evening performances of what he has termed dance dramas. Uh, again, I owe much of my inspiration for this and my research, the springboard from Nancy Regalado, who was an academic in uh, America, um, and Hazel Denson for putting me on to her. Thank you very much, Hazel. And um, she uh, began opening this up. There has been other people who uh, sort of touched on the tournoi, um, tournoi. Uh, and, uh, or oh, Chauvency, as I should say, uh, there, and I am in the process of reconstructing the Robidel and the, and the Chapelet, which are two of the pieces that he describes. Basically, in a nutshell, a medieval tournament followed um, fighting, the men fight during the day, the women take over in the evening and produce the evening entertainments. High status women, not low status, high status, and particularly with um, uh, Robidal, he, uh, in his account, he has the account of a pastoral scene, shepherd and shepherdess being performed, the shepherd trying to woo the shepherdess, uh, using acrobatic movements, slapping the floor, cartwheeling, uh, eventually winning over the shepherdess and kissing her, then to be revealed as the, uh, as a woman, as they're both women, which of course he feigns surprise at, um, uh, as they're kissing on the uh, on the stage on the performance area, and uh, uh, and it is the highest status I believe the Countess of Lorraine uh, who is danced that piece. Um, we have evidence here of acrobatic movement, of lively movement, of pastoral stories being told, um, um, to dance dramas uh, being produced bespoke for that event, which I believe then bled into Tudor tournaments. Um, now, to focus in on, this is a couple, this is my final sort of, what, what can we do? If we wanted to reconstruct medieval dance, what can we do? Now, um, to take it as a case study, if I was to, to, to look, and this ties in with what I've done with, uh, with Chauvency. The Estampi, this is one that many people have an opinion on, particularly, I think, because of the name. Uh, everywhere, if you search anywhere, it goes, it is thought to have been the earliest solo couple dance. That comes from the EDC website. There is no evidence at all that says that it is a solo couple dance. Nowhere in the original source material, nowhere says it. Uh, the assumption that the Estampi was a dance for one couple at a time comes with it. a second assumption that it was danced from an audience present doctrine has it that they were danced by one man and one woman as a couple. That was Peggy Dixon. Mm, there's no evidence for that. She, you know, Aubrey may have said it. Uh, Dixon decided to assume it. Um, Anne Belinda Quarry. So let us assume. You know what she makes? That the Estampi was a dancer. Duh. Why? Why? Now the next two slides, um, uh, actually I will flick through the, oh, oopsie dozy there we go. Uh, this is, I've just collated here, a whole range of what uh, the reference materials are for the Estampi. The first couple of dance, uh, there we go, third one down, the Estampi was another circle dance that replaced the carol. Ooh, was it? Um, uh, dramas devised by the troubadours, it's a couple dance. Uh, if we go on, um, uh, just some of these because I'm conscious of time. Uh, the word stamp originated from stamping the feet. Mm, Malali has a great argument in the, uh, uh, for this um, as to the, the fact the word stamping doesn't mean it at all. Um, uh, you know, a stampy most popular dance in the medieval, but it might, in, it, uh, it was complicated that it didn't encourage impure thoughts. Not, where is this coming from? Originating in France was char characterized by elaborate body movements. 
that comes from music history is thrilling. Um, uh, Stampy is a dance musical form. Uh, the dance is largely unknown, yes. Paintings the period, however, depict the dance involving heavily, heavy hopping and or jumping. Really? I wish they'd, they'd point me to the source there. Um, uh, so, and this is the SCA. All of the dancing in the 13th and 14th centuries are type of a stampy, apart from the other ones that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, which are also dances. Uh, this dance style is thought to have been derived from sacred music of the time. Wow, there's a lot of people out there who think they know what the stampy is. Um, but we don't know. We don't know what it is. <laughs> um, why do we say that we know what it is? So my first, my, I suppose my first aim is to let's get rid of the word farandal. My second aim is to go, let's stop trying to say, this is what medieval dance was. We don't know. We have ideas and we can justify by being historically for, uh, informed. Um, we can justify interpretations, but we cannot say for definite that's what it was. Is that a reason not to do it? No, it's not because it's brilliant and the music's brilliant. Right. Now, so uh, if I just go uh, back, there we go. Um, uh, what does the word mean? Stationary feet. This is all interpretations that have been said. Stationary feet, turning feet, delay, stamping, gliding, frolicking, to run away. That would be interesting, a dance piece which has you running off the stage. Um, well, there was one, of course, in the 1970s, which uh, he took uh, four minutes, 32, I think, where he stood on stage. So, absolutely still for four minutes 32 maybe it was that um so this is actually my uh, this is my final uh, slide um when uh, i have um uh, inter you know been called on and when i've been asked and when i myself have <laughs> interpreted or reinterpreted the estampi i've looked at these options and i believe we should come at these interpreting these dances with options first of all we have options from the iconography can be many things and the iconography could relate to any many styles of dance. Uh, the accounts never name dances, um, specifically and tied them with movement. Um, the uh, music we have, but the music can be interpreted differently as well. And a different interpretation, the music leads to a different interpretation of choreography. And this is what that can be. Um, so that is, uh, uh, so these are some of the options that I've come up with. Um, it could have been, actually, I will start with the fact that it could be a dancer de, it could be that stately, slow, uh, noble dance that uh, couples did. Who knows? But that's an option. So I'm going to put it in. Number two. Now, this came from my interpretation of Estampes being uh, numbered in the Chansonnier. Uh, they are numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, if something is numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, it could be that they are some sort of progressive training uh, study, that they could be a set of exams that you need to pass. Um, it could be a, a set that you could call upon. Uh, oh, can you just, can we just do a stamping number three, please? And I've got something to that. So the fact they numbers, you know, it has some sort of formalized, um, interchangeability about it. Uh, so that could be another option. Might not be, could be. Uh, we have this uh, this interpretation, you know, maybe a stampede does, is something to do with stamping, low, grounded, uh, shuffling, maybe, uh, carol. Um, so again, another choreography that I've created is, it follows that form. Um, a celebratory group dance. Um, you know, it could be some sort of celebratory. Let's have no it's stamping number six. Way that could be what it is. Uh, finally, it could be. Now I say this improvisational. Um, um, really, as I've developed from even writing this, actually, I would say slash bespoke, and I think this ties in with Chauvency. One of my. Um, uh, uh, one of my uh, my theories, uh, and I believe this is borne out when you study slightly later, so the post mid fifteenth century, and we move into particularly in this country in England into the Henrician forms um, and tournament dance, mm -hmm. is that we have um, bespoke choreographies for events, um, for 
um, tournaments uh, and for grand celebrations. And the, each of these, they had pieces of music and then choreographies would be done, but they would be done as one off and that's why they weren't written down. Um, they were, the people had training in dance, the high nobles had training in dance, but they only created, they didn't do a formalized dance. They did a piece which was lively, athletic, acrobatic, joyous, uh, told narrative, but it was bespoke. Do I have much evidence for that? Mm. In the 13th century, no, but it's a theory. Um, but it's something that as I explore this, uh, this period, um, we will carry on. Now, uh, just to finish off, here we go. Uh, I, what I, I do this because I, it is my passion as I've begun with. Um, what I want to call, what I would, would like to inspire people from this lecture to do is to go, don't be bound by the inflexibility of the concept of authenticity. Okay, let's, let's break ourselves free from that. Let's pay due reference and let us be respectful of the sources and of the history, but let's learn from that. Let's springboard out of this. Um, let us also realize, second point, modern interpretations will always be filtered through our own period eye. The period eye, Michael Baxendahl, is, is we are children of, we are children of the 21st century or the 20th century. You know, we're never gonna know what it's like to live in a medieval period or to be a medieval person. We can have our own version of it, but we don't truly know it. So therefore, let go of it. Let's create our own version of it. But again, by making, paying reference to the, the past. There is this idea, I think, of Domenico as a first deconstructor, that when that actually, let's look at what Domenico produced and Sir Ibra and Conlazzano uh, and the Atsalus in Brussels in late 15th century, the first manuscripts that we have, don't look at them as the ones that sort of were you know, that's what it was before. Let's look at them as actually the reaction against what came before. So let's see that they deconstructed movement, that movement was wild, was free, was unabandoned prior to uh, this sudden restriction of the fifth, late 15th century. Um, did they, did Domenico, did he reconstruct the movement and break it down uh, to something and control it? Um, possibly. And Mark Franco, uh, dear Mark Franco, has written on uh, you know, many aspects of this uh, subject as well, um, although with later periods, uh, but um, see new and the old. Let's take these beautiful pieces of music. Let's take these interesting pictures. Let's take some of these accounts. Let's not be afraid to create something new by being respectful of the old and keeping the old alive. That's where I will finish. So thank you very much for listening to me. Um, once again, I hope to join for the questions. Um, if I can't, I'm sorry, I'm tied up in Barclay Castle um, doing um, some vultering, actually. Um, uh, so, um, uh, but if you do have any questions and, I'm, uh, uh, and you wish to talk to me or contact me afterwards, then please, please do feel free. Um, I'm always willing to discuss this. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it um, uh, and uh, have a great evening. Thank you very much. Bye bye. <laughs>